How well do we ever really know another person? Think back to all those people you were at high school with. If you're working, how well do you really know your co-workers? What do they get up to when they're not around you? Interesting thought, isn't it? Well, that's the preoccupation of tonight's story. How well do you really know those other people that you spend your lives around? Now, my dear friends, this one gets pretty creepy, so make sure you've got a friend to hold your hand <laughs> while you're listening. If not, don't worry. I'm there with you spiritually, if not in body, okay? Now, sit back and relax with your favorite drink, because it's time to listen. It's weird. After going to school with someone your whole life, you'd think you'd know them. Well, no, you don't. There's always something else to people. I don't know why he chose me. I, mean, I never really stood out. In high school, I only ever talked to him a few times, but still, he chose me. Peter Welsh. Remembering back, Peter was known as the odd kid. Everyone knew it. All through elementary school and middle school, he had, well, violent tendencies. All the kids at school used to talk about how he scratched Mrs. Tory. In high school, something strange happened. He became an entirely new person. I guess when he became completely normal, we all forgot about it. He just kind of blended in. As I write this, I'm scared. I've been scared for the past year. The kind of scared where every day I wake up and I think of Peter. I've been forced to do bad things. Well, I'm not a good person, but Peter... Oh, Peter is pure evil. I'm not sure I'll ever be able to go back to how I was, to be completely honest. I don't know why I'm still fighting it. I've long lost anything worth fighting for. The summer rain is picking up now, and it'll soon be midnight. I'll have a bit of time to tell you why I've done certain things, and why I'm going to have to do the things that I will do. After graduating from high school, I was unsure about going to college, so I decided just to take a short break from it all. Well, that short time off turned into a two-year break. At the start of my third year off from school, things started looking up. My girlfriend, JC, had a friend who was able to hook me up with a decent paying job at a gym. With the little money that JC and I saved, we were able to buy a house up on a hill on the outskirts of town. Our small home was at the top of a hill that would take about five minutes to walk up. This hill also had the only road that led into town, so it was always really grueling to have to make this trek. Behind our house was a forest, or what would count as a forest in Illinois. This small cluster of trees was not commonly explored by me, but my dog would always run around in it. Now, trust me, every detail is important to my story. The first time I saw Peter after graduation was at work. It was a Monday, and apparently weeks before he'd applied for a job at the gym. He got hired, and that day was his first day at work. I was tasked with showing Peter the ropes of the job. At the time, Peter was just another person I knew. We barely even acknowledged that we'd known each other before. I know now that Peter had begun stalking me, and getting a job at the gym was just another part of his plan. Peter seemed nice enough at first, and he generally kept to himself. I only started noticing odd things with Peter about two weeks after he got the job. He began going out of his way to make me seem bad to the other co-workers. During our lunch breaks, he would tell stories about me at school to the other employees. These lies would make me feel extremely uncomfortable, and, honestly, they really annoyed me. Co-workers became more distant, and it was clear that Peter was ruining my reputation. It was also apparent that our boss was starting to favor Peter, and he soon passed me up in the job ranks. I was okay with it, as I was starting to learn that life isn't always fair. Now, 
I still remember everything about what happened next. One early Friday morning, Caleb, my boss, assigned me with the task of turning on the power to the gym. This was cumbersome, because it required me to actually leave the building and walk to a wooden shed which had contained circuit breakers. This small wooden prison was filled with abandoned bird nests and spider webs. I finished putting on my sweater and then began my short trek. The second I stepped foot outside, I knew something was wrong, and I smelled smoke coming from the shed. I jogged over and opened it up to see a small fire in the corner of the room under the breaker and electronics. Smoke began to escape as fire crawled up the wall. I went into panic mode and probably made the wrong decision by running back to the gym for water. I quickly filled the janitor's bucket with water, and I was about to head back when I saw Peter at the doorway, looking at the shack, which was now engulfed by a blanket of fire. I fell to the ground and began to hyperventilate. About a minute went by of me trying to calm down. I finally came to my senses and yelled at Peter. Hey, asshole, why don't you do something? Calm down, George, he said in a monotone voice. Life is going to start getting more interesting for you. Peter then turned and walked back into the lobby of the gym. I just couldn't wrap my head around what he was saying. My mind was focused on the now collapsed and burning shack. Finally, I was able to call the police with my phone and then tell Caleb, who began to curse and pace around outside. We had to close the gym due to having to deal with the police and the fire department. About two hours went by before my boss approached me. He looked enraged, almost like he wanted to punch me right there. He began to talk as quietly as he could in his enraged state. What the hell is wrong with you? Are you too much of a wimp to try to just talk with me? You really had to go and do this shit? I didn't understand what he was trying to say. I was both dumbfounded and anxious. I barely managed to... What? He chuckled and wiped his hand across his unshaven face. Peter told me you were angry about his promotion. <sighs> I never realized you were this childish. You should have spoken with me about it instead of trying to get back at me. I never said anything to Peter. Hell, I wasn't even mad about his promotion. I tried my best to sound calm. I don't know what you're talking about. I never... He interrupted. Just get out before I decide to tell the cops. I didn't know what to do. I probably should have stayed and tried to explain, but I didn't. I just stumbled away from him and made my way to the door. I was about to leave, but I got a sudden urge to confront Peter. I looked around my shoulder and no longer saw Caleb, so I took a sharp turn into the lunchroom. There was Peter, talking it up with my old work friends. They all went silent when they noticed I'd walked in. Peter stood and said, with a slight hint of joy in his voice, Oh, uh, <laughs> what's up, George? I didn't know what to say or do. I just stood there facing him with pure anger. It felt surreal. My body sort of acted without me thinking. Without hesitation, I punched Peter in the face. It was the first time in my life I actually was trying to cause major harm on someone. He fell to the ground and blood began to flow from his nose. I immediately came back to my senses and I realized that I needed to leave. I began to walk out of the building, but then... Peter began to laugh. I didn't know what to think of him, other than that he was a sick fuck. A month went by. I just didn't understand why Peter had framed me. I was distressed by this for a few weeks, but I was soon able to begin to forget about the whole thing. I never even thought about calling the police about it. To be honest, I don't hold grudges. Even when I want to, I always seem to get over it. I was already looking for a new job, 
Staying at home wasn't paying the bills, but getting a job without a college education was difficult. JC was having to work all day, so I would just stay at home alone with my dog and do mundane tasks around the house. I was beginning to become chronically bored. My mind would replace this boredom with anxiety about Peter. I'd stay awake at night wondering why he'd screwed me over. I was trying to find any possible explanation. Luckily, I found a way to distract myself. I would take my dog on early morning runs up the hill around my house. Fog would usually cover the top of the hill those mornings, making it hard to see much of what was ahead of me. It was a Saturday, and I was stepping out of my doorway. JC had left earlier to go deal with some credit card problems. I noticed Calvin, our dog, was immediately uptight. His blonde fur stood up, and he was anxious to get up the hill. We started up the hill, and Calvin only got worse. He began to constantly growl, and he was wanting to get up the hill as fast as possible. About 50 yards from the top, Calvin stopped and he wouldn't budge. He was just staring up the hill and growling. I was getting angry with him until I saw what he saw. An outline of someone in the fog. My heart started racing. We had no neighbours, and it was nine in the morning. I thought maybe I was just seeing things, or that I was just being paranoid, until I saw it move. The person began to walk down the hill towards me. I just stood there telling myself oh, it was just someone on a walk. I honestly don't know why I was so scared at the time. Maybe the fear was well founded because guess who came into view? Yes, Peter Welsh. I was just amazed at the time. I didn't know what Peter wanted with me. He finally reached me. He was wearing a grey beanie, his long black hair sticking out from underneath. He had his hands in his pocket and was smiling. Hey, George, it's been a while. What's wrong with you? What do you want from me? I don't want anything from you. I'm going to call the cops. Get the hell out of here. What are you going to tell them? That I'm scaring you? I noticed his nose was crooked and figured I'd broken it when I punished him. And this made me feel dominant for a second. I'm going to give you five seconds to get out of my sight. Peter then pulled out a small stack of pictures from his pocket and handed them to me. I took them carefully. I almost jumped from goosebumps when I looked at the contents of the photos. Every picture was of me. There were some of me cooking food. Some of me talking with JC, and some were of me sleeping, and these had to have been taken from inside my room. Peter seemed intrigued at my reaction. What? You thought I was done with you, Georgie? How, how did you know I was going to be out here this morning? I know everything about you. I've invested a great deal in you. I usually only spend a few months on my clients, but I needed a change. I wanted a long-term project. At the time, I didn't know what he was talking about. I was just filled with pure anger. I now know that Peter had terrorized at least two people before me. I clenched my fist and was about to punch Peter again. But he must have been expecting it because he immediately slammed his hand into my face. I fell to the moist, hard ground, with all the air knocked out of me. I turned around to see Peter holding a small handgun. He was now grinning. He just couldn't hold back anymore. Don't try anything like that again, George. You got me good last time, and I don't want to hurt you, yet. There wouldn't be any fun in that. What do you want with me? What did I do to you? I asked frantically. You didn't do anything. You were simply a convenient target. Now, here's what's gonna happen. 
I don't want to cause any unwanted attention. So JC is going to leave the picture. She's hopefully being questioned by the police right now, who will most likely take her away. I did what I do best. Frame people. I was able to get into her American Express account and purchased <laughs> stuff. I purposefully left some digital trails behind and placed physical evidence in her car. Don't get mad at me. I could have taken the easy option, but I didn't. It would have caused too much attention. Plus, it will make the next part fun. So you should thank me. Now the police are going to start to investigate you. I recommend you leave the state. And that's where I come in. My part will be to find and track you down. And then kill you. If you attempt to call the cops, I will find out. I hope this is all getting to you. Your life is going to start falling apart. I'm going to leave now and give you a week to do whatever you like. And then I will come after you. I've only had one client that has completely escaped. And his name was Julian. I simply lost interest in finding him. I've learned a lot from my last clients, though. So I have the advantage. And that's okay. Because I like to win this game. Here's my number in case you have any questions. He handed me a piece of paper with his number and continued. <laughs> Good luck, George. Remember, no cops. Bye. I laid on the ground staring at the clouds for probably an hour. I'd missed a call from JC. I never called back. Looking back on all this, I abandoned her without even thinking about it. I stumbled my way back to the house. I didn't eat for a day. Well, I didn't think for a day. I just stayed in bed looking at the ceiling. I didn't have any emotion at all for the first few days. I simply didn't feel anything. Panic mode set in on the third day as I realized my situation. I decided I'd drive to Missouri and figure things out there. During the rest of the week, I would come very close to calling the police, but I always stopped myself. On the fifth day, I drove to an ATM and withdrew $2,000 which was the limit amount I could withdraw. On the way back home, when I was driving up the opposite side of the hill from my house, I saw something that made my heart stop. Dark smoke was rising from the other side of the hill. I sped up to the top of the hill and stopped. My house was wrapped in a blanket of fire. I saw my dog barking furiously at the forest behind our house. It was also beginning to catch fire. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. This shit just doesn't happen to people like me. My phone vibrated in my pocket at that moment. And my non-functioning mind decided just to answer it without thinking. Hello? Is this George Blankley? Yes, I said. This is Officer Guzman. I'm going to need you to come into Springfield County Police Department and talk with us. I... When? It's very important. I prefer right now. <laughs> right now? Yes. That's what we want, Mr. Blankley. Okay, sure. Right as I was about to turn my car around, I noticed around ten empty gas cans laying near my front door, which were starting to burn. There was no waiting when I got to the police station. I was immediately set down in the interrogation room opposite Mr. Guzman. He was a Latino man, probably in his mid-forties. It was now around 7pm, and there was a lot of commotion at the department. I was still in shock from everything, and I realized I hadn't changed my clothes in days. Officer Guzman cleared his throat and began. Do you know why you're here, Mr. Blackley? No, I replied. Well... It so happens that your girlfriend, J.C. Collins, the one who called you five days ago that you didn't answer to, 
is involved in a narcotics case. Do you know anything about that? No. Well, we found that she made purchases on a few dark web websites. She went through the trouble of doing it on the dark web, but she did a shitty ass job of hiding it. We seized the narcotics that she purchased online. We're going to arrest her back at your place, but she came right to us, complaining about credit card fraud. We probably would have taken her side, but after searching her car, we found a half pound of cocaine stuffed in her seats, and also an unregistered firearm in the trunk. It's kind of interesting that you ignored her call, and also didn't wonder where she's been for five days. Yeah, seems a bit odd. Am I under arrest? I managed to ask. No, son. I just want to talk. Then, I don't have to be here. I stood up and basically sprinted out the building. I got in my car and drove. I drove further than Missouri. I found a super cheap hotel in Kansas where I decided to stay for a while. I wasn't making money. I was basically running myself dry. I knew Peter's game was now in full effect. So I attempted to cover my tracks. I shaved my hair, got a new phone and number. I wasn't the experienced manhunter, so I knew Peter was going to eventually find me. I was staying in a terrible neighborhood in the ghetto, so it didn't take too long before I found someone who sold me a small revolver. I needed it so that I could feel safe. I also began searching the internet for any trace of the Peter survivor named Julian. It took me several weeks, but after continuous searching, I found a user on Reddit named Julian117, who'd posted this the prior year. I have a story to tell, a real one. I met Peter at my job at Target. He was genuinely good, well, so I thought. The story goes on, very similar to my own. Julian seemed to have gotten it worse, though. His house was burnt down the same as mine. Peter gave him a similar speech about the game. At the end of his very long post, Julian said this. I know Peter is going to someday try to do this to someone else. I want to help whoever he picks next. Please contact me. My number is... Julian got right back to me. He took it very seriously and we decided to meet up. For his safety, he wanted me to meet him at a public library. I arrived first and sat at the table he told me to go to. He came in ten minutes later and sat down. He looked to be about my age, with dark rings under his eyes and an unshaven scruff. His hair was long and wild, and he was wearing all black with a hoodie. He was clearly paranoid. He spoke first. I only know one thing that can help you. It helped me. I drove five hours here to give you this flash drive. Did you bring your computer? Yeah, I did. Plug it in and download its contents. I did what he said. When it was done downloading, a new icon showed up. It was the default icon that shows up when the developers don't pick one. I opened it up to see what was obviously an app that wasn't made for the public. It had blank information spaces and a map icon. Julian took the computer and started filling in the information. What's Peter's number? asked Julian. I gave him the number. Peter did one good thing. He gave me his number. Julian finished typing and then hit the map icon. I used the phone number to get his IP. Using this, I'm able to use the program to live track where he's been up to five minutes ago. He showed me the computer screen. It showed Peter was 20 miles away five minutes ago. Oh, this was terrifying. I couldn't believe that Peter had managed to track me that quickly. I have to go now. I don't want to be near you. (laughs) No offense. Thank you, man, I replied. He rushed out of the library. Peter knew I was in Kansas, and he was only 20 miles away. Peter seemed to be searching around my area. He would get closer some days, and farther away on others. 
I was able to find out he was staying in a much nicer hotel than me. One day I tracked him going to the library I'd had my meeting in. This terrified me. Peter was on to me. I would frequently go to the library because I had no outlets to charge my computer at my motel. I'd make sure Peter was miles away before going, though. I went to the library the day after Peter made his trip there, and the librarian asked me, Are you George? I nodded, and she handed me an envelope that read, From Peter. I opened it right there and then, still standing in front of the librarian. It was a picture of Julian from afar. It was written on with a red marker that said, No unwanted attention. I assumed Julian was now dead. I ran out of there and never returned. I started charging at a coffee shop. I wanted to leave Kansas, but I simply didn't have enough money to do that. What I had left was being used on gas. I also had to stop using my credit card. I knew the police were looking for me, so I didn't want to risk letting them find any trace. I was spending a Friday night locked in my hotel room, with a gun on the bed as usual. I regularly watched the Illinois news on my hotel TV, and tonight was no exception. <laughs> it was definitely surprising to see myself on the news, with the subtitle, Wanted, and a picture of me off my old Facebook. The anchor began to talk. 22-year-old George Blankley is wanted by the state of Illinois for trafficking of narcotics. Blankley and his girlfriend, J.C. Collins, are both suspects, but Blankley was able to flee and burn down his house with the evidence inside before police could arrest him. A classmate and former co-worker describes how he interacted with George. Then, guess who was on the TV? Peter fucking well. He was wearing a button-up shirt and he was sitting in front of a bookcase that was out of focus. His name was displayed at the bottom of the screen and the subtext said, Former friend slash co-worker. He began speaking. Yeah, I knew both JC and George. JC was always a nice girl and it's such a shame that George manipulated her. I offer my condolences to both families. JC is getting the sentence she deserves of ten years. George first started acting up around work. He had a huge lash out of work one day and decided to burn the power room down. Then, hours later, he broke my nose. I always thought he was such a nice kid. I never knew what he was capable of. George, please tell us where you're at. Turn yourself in. The segment ended, and I lay there, staring at the TV. Everyone I know now thinks I'm a screw-up piece of shit drug dealer. My family is probably devastated. JC is probably ruined. I felt anger begin to boil in my veins. Peter destroyed my reputation, my life, my happiness. And now he's going to kill me. All so he can satisfy his psychopathic urges. I grabbed the gun without hesitation shot the TV. I was immediately aware of what I'd just done, so I packed my stuff and got in my car and drove. I drove an hour until I reached another town. This one being more poverty-filled than the last. I parked my car in the parking lot of a Planet Fitness and began to cry. It took two months for Peter to figure out the town I was now in. I once again discovered where Peter was staying, so I stayed clear. Something odd happened one night when I was tracking Peter. The program gave me an error message followed by IP connection lost. I never gained Peter's IP again. After that night, I became extremely anxious. I would go on three hour long walks just so I wouldn't stay in one spot and risk being found. Every morning I would wake up terrified that Peter was going to find me. It was now a year since Peter began his hunt for me. I'd also run out of money around this time. I was forced to steal food and anything else of value. I had a bit of gas left that I was saving. But other than that and my gun, I had nothing. 
The only thing that was stopping me from going after Peter the whole time were my morals. But now, with time, even those had faded. I couldn't go on living like this anymore. The police were against me. People were against me. Peter was against me. So now, I'm sitting in my car while the summer rain pours outside, in front of Peter's hotel room. <laughs> I hope you understand. The lady at the counter was nice enough to tell me which room Peter was in. I told her he was an old friend. The door to Peter's room is now in front of me. I tied my hand on the gun in my jacket pocket and knocked. Nothing. I kept knocking, and finally someone opened the door. It was Julian, smiling when he saw me. He looked even more insane than the last time. Then I felt an object push up against my head. And I heard Peter's voice. Open the door and step inside, George. I did what he said. Inside there were maps posted all over the walls. Pictures of me were scattered everywhere. The blinds were duct tape closed, and a normal light had been replaced with a red one. We all made our way to the middle of the room, and Peter directed me to face him. Julian sat on the bed, still with a grin on his face. I still had my hand on my small revolver. Peter began. Yeah, I definitely made it harder for myself when I gave you the IP tracker. I wasn't planning on using it. It would have been way too easy. <laughs> Julian never escaped me. I let him live, promising him a good life if he helped me with my next client. He did a good job and served his purpose. A promise is a promise, Julian. You can leave. Julian walked out of the room and began to run when he got to the hallway. Why spend so much time to set this up just to kill me? I asked. Everyone needs their hobby. And this is the only one that satisfies me. I don't plan on stopping until I get caught. Ruining everything about you, and then spending months looking for you, is just part of the fun. It's living. It's really living. Now, here's what's gonna happen. Peter reached for something in his pocket. He pulled out a taser, aimed it at me, and shot. I fell to the floor in immense pain and lay there not able to move. I'm not sorry I had to ruin your reputation, but I can sympathize with you. I always had to be ridiculed by other kids, and it... <laughs> A shot was fired from behind the door, and Peter fell to the ground. I was now getting my movement back, so I looked over to see Julian with a gun in one hand. He came in and helped me up off the ground. I stood there, looking at Peter. After all this time thinking of Peter as an evil entity that couldn't be killed, it was weird to realize he was just a person who was as vulnerable as anyone else. Peter was dead, and so was my fear. We could now hear the police sirens in the distance. We gave each other a knowing look. I can never repay Julian for what he did. The summer rain is now beginning to come down hard, and it's almost soothing. I know I'll never get to live out a normal life, but I don't need that to be happy. I'm happy now, without Peter in my life.